Welcome back. Welcome back to this special programme looking back at some of the highlights of Frost Over the World during the past six months. In March, I travelled to Nicaragua to meet President Daniel Ortega, his first television interview since he returned to power. As a young man, he'd led the Sandinistas into revolution and a civil war against the corrupt Somoza dictatorship before eventually becoming president. We talked back and reflected on those early days. As, as the time approached for the revolution, in addition to speaking and all of that, was it also a case that you had to fight as well? D did you get that sort of training in Cuba? I mean, were you, was it kill or be killed as well as speaking and so on? And giving speeches. Sí. Yes. In uh, 1978, I was in charge of a guerrilla unit in the insurrection in northern Nicaragua. And uh, so we were fighting against the National Guard. And in combat, you are not sure. You are shooting, they are shooting, the bullets are all around you, and so you are not really sure if you are killing this enemy or the other. But we were two enemies firing at each other, and at the end of the combat, uh, we found a number of the guardsmen who had been killed and one of their officers had been killed. One of our members had been wounded, so I cannot say how many men I killed, but yes, I was in a situation where you had to kill or be killed. That was a situation of great tension, but um, I had had other experiences as well. For example, there was Somoza's worst henchman. He was a specialist in torture. He had tortured me, and he had tortured many other persons. The Frente Sandinista de Liberación Nacional had decided to execute him, so there was an operation in which I participated when we went in with submachine guns, and we went after him, and he tried to fight, but there were many more of us, and we managed to kill him. Daniel Ortega there in Nicaragua. Next, Jesse Jackson for whom the advent of a black president was a particularly emotional landmark. Jesse, it's great to see you again. Oh, Welcome yeah. back to London. After all of these years. After all of these years, going back 40 years or so. Yeah. Indeed. It's very exciting to have you here. And tell me, are you feeling encouraged? You were, I will never forget the sight of your tears of joy on election night in November. Are you encouraged by the way things are going under I President am. Obama? It's, it's a great moment, you know, in American history, and, and it's affecting the entire world as somewhat a kind of infectious joy, a kind of extended hope that we are realizing. And I think on that night, um, two things happened. One, there was the joy of that moment, because I saw in my mind's eye people in the villages of Kenya and Zimbabwe and, and Haiti and Ireland and poor people who hoped for this change. They saw this guy, many of them couldn't pronounce his name. They didn't have a plasma TV screen, didn't have internet, but they kind of knew something was amiss. And so I felt their presence, but they couldn't be there. It was the same park that we were tear gassed in 40 years ago, trying to end the Vietnam War at the 6th State Democratic Convention. And then I thought about the martyrs and the marchers, the murdered who made that night possible. I thought about trying to get them to train the two Jews and the black who were killed about the right to vote. And Meg Evers about the right to vote, Dr. King. I wish so much that Dr. King could have been there for a moment in time. I met Evers, and so I thought about yeah. the force that made the journey possible, and it was a night of, of tears of real joy. John Kerry, the new chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, was very clear 
about the challenges for the new administration when we talked. Challenges particularly in the Middle East. All of us understand that the rush to confrontation of the Bush administration really turned the Middle East topsy-turvy. And we lost opportunity after opportunity to be able to listen to legitimate efforts to try to move towards peace. An example of that, in 2002, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia made a very bold initiative, the Arab Peace Initiative, which never got the focus and attention that it should have. I believe the Arab Peace Initiative can be the foundation of building a renewed effort to find peace between the Palestinians and Israel, and indeed, for us to begin to move with Syria, reach out to Iran, and change the dynamics of a region that for too long has been waiting for a, a peaceful resolution. While I was in Washington on that trip, I talked with Zbigniew Brzezinski. He was, of course, President Carter's national security advisor, and I wanted him to compare the world he encountered then in the 70s with the world as it is today and as he sees it today in 2009. Going back for a moment to when you first entered the White House um, back in 1976, how different is the world that the Obama regime uh, encounters today different from the world when you came face to face with it then? I mean, do you feel safer or less secure? Um, do you feel happier or sadder? What are the key differences well, that's in that a very, period? Very good question. Um, first of all, let me just make one general observation. Everyone in a position of serious responsibility always feels that the threats one confronts are unprecedented. Because the threats in the past are already in the past. So one way or another, we survive them. Uh, yeah. My sense is the opposite. My sense is that the threats we faced were far more serious than the threats we face now in terms really? of geopolitics yeah. and international security. We were on the edge, always, of a cataclysmic conflict which could erupt within minutes and which within hours would produce, in effect, the end of American society, perhaps with the added satisfaction of the end of the Soviet society <laughs> yeah, if, through our response. I had three minutes in coordinating the president's nuclear response to inform the president about the scale of attack. He had four minutes in which to review the options which we had anticipated depending on the nature of the attack at scale to decide how we respond. We then had, I don't want to be too precise, but X number of minutes to execute, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps not, to evacuate the president, and assuming a large-scale attack to which we respond in a predictably large-scale fashion, within six hours, 80, 90 million Americans dead. Today, we, feel we confront a very different world. We confront a world which is much more dispersed, uh, much more chaotic. We don't have that kind of a threat. But we do have a threat of a very serious, potentially endless American engagement in a part of the world that I call my writings the global Balkans, an area which sucks in great powers, like the Balkans used yeah. to, and from which we may not be able to extricate ourselves for years and years to come. Now to a powerful story of childhood. In March, I spoke to Emmanuel Jow forced to become a child soldier with rebels in Sudan at the age of just eight. He told me the young fighters were forced to take extreme measures in order to survive. What happened early on, there was, there was no food, so we're depending on vultures, snails, some were eating snakes and frogs. Those were our meals. And then when a dead body dies, so we'll use those dead bodies to trap this animals or uh, scavengers to come and we shoot them. And after a while, those animals kept off. And when they kept off, so one of the magicians that was with us started eating dead bodies. And for me, my friend was dying that night. And I look at him and I tell him, I'm going to eat you tomorrow. So and, and that was the, the most difficult point in my life. Apart from seeing people die throughout the book, I explain about how people are dying. But this is the most uh, 
uh, the, the moment that brought me to, to my lowest level. Right, and you obviously you thought about it, and then you gave up the thought. You, a few hours later, you decided you couldn't do it? No, what happened is that I, I was about to do it, but I, had, I prayed and I said, God, if you're there, give me something to eat. And then I had to wait and fight the temptation of not eating the person. So one side of my brain tell me, this is the only way for you to survive. You have to eat this person. The other side tell me, no, you can't. It's a sin, it's bad, you know, so it's a whole argument the whole night. In a moment, we'll hear from UK Prime Minister Gordon Brown and former Pakistan President Pervez Musharraf. He'll be telling us about his fall from power. Join us again after this incredibly short break.